I think there should be special treatment given towards the uh, start of worker cooperatives. I think there should be incentivization from governments to make worker cooperatives more feasible. That's one of the problems with worker co-ops is they don't have initial investors the same way private capital uh, companies do. And the simple reason being is that if you are someone who's looking to invest in something, you'd probably want to extract as much wealth as possible from your investment. So the idea of investing into one over the other might seem not as lucrative, but that be might be one of the reasons why that they've received uh, grants in the past. Back in June, self-identified socialist India Walton won the Democratic primary in the Buffalo mayoral race over incumbent Byron Brown. Given that the Republican Party is virtually non-existent in Buffalo, as it is in most larger American cities, she will likely be the next mayor. Upon her victory, Walton gave a speech where she gave a shout out to the Democratic Socialists of America. So I'm, I'm very proud to be a Democratic Socialist. I am proud to have the support of Buffalo DSA and National DSA. Uh, I received a call from Congresswoman AOC. The online left celebrated Walton's win as a victory for their side, which it surely is. You know, there's been so much misinformation about the term socialism over the years that people have been afraid to really engage with what that means and what these candidates uh, are fighting for and what people who are socialists are, are fighting for. So it's important to have more high profile socialists like this so that people can actually learn and understand that socialism is not a scary term but actually means that you will have more freedom you will have more democracy so clearly here india walton is a great representative of that and i'm excited to see what she does with uh, with buffalo interestingly i saw at the same time members of the dsa were having a little get together in venezuela in fact just a few weeks after walton's victory members of the dsa met with venezuelan president nicolas maduro now i was told as recently as the 2020 democratic primary when bernie sanders was still running that bringing up venezuela was a cheap shot if your rebuttal involves referencing the soviet union venezuela or cuba you have no rebuttal because that's a straw man we're not talking about that type of socialism. We're talking about the kind that's practiced in Iceland, the kind that's passed in Denmark, Sweden, Norway. I was just in Norway. Everyone is happier in Norway. It's just a scare tactic and a straw man. Bernie is an international moderate who just wants America to be like Denmark. Furthermore, Venezuela isn't even an example of the consequences of socialism. Rather, it's a great example of what happens when your country relies too much on oil, and when Western capitalists intervene in your economy, and when America places brutal sanctions on you, and when you embrace authoritarianism. But it's definitely not socialism. This is all very odd, because I'm old enough to remember when Venezuela was true socialism. It actually wasn't that long ago. Back in 2013, following Hugo Chavez's death, David Sirota, former speechwriter for Bernie Sanders, praised Hugo Chavez's economic miracle in the pages of Salon. While Sirota did say that Chavez's human rights record was far from perfect, Sirota wrote that, Chavez became the bugaboo of American politics because of his full-throated advocacy of socialism and redistributionism at one once represented a fundamental critique of neoliberal economics and also delivered some indisputably positive results. Indeed, as shown by some of the most significant indicators, Chavez racked up an economic record that a legacy-obsessed American president could only dream of achieving. When a country goes socialist and it craters, it is laughed off as a harmless, forgettable cautionary tale about the perils of command economics. When, by contrast, a country goes socialist and its economy does what Venezuela's did, it is not perceived to be a laughing matter, and it is not so easy to write off or ignore. It suddenly looks like a threat to the corporate capitalism, especially when said country has valuable oil reserves that global powerhouses like the United States rely on. Like I said earlier, this dude was Bernie Sanders' speechwriter during his 2020 presidential campaign. But remember, Bernie just wants America to be like Denmark. Nowadays, you'll have a lot more trouble finding defenders of Venezuela or Chavez's legacy, much less the presidency of his successor, Nicolas Maduro. That's not true democratic socialism. And of course, democratic socialism is redundant. 
Socialism is merely the extension of democracy into the workplace in the form of worker-owned cooperatives. That's all modern socialists want. They want to end the tyranny of bosses and their theft of workers' wage labor, and to put workers in charge of the means of production. How they go about achieving this goal, they're not quite sure about. During his debate with JF, Lance from the Serfs suggested some form of government subsidy. Once people saw the merits of workplace democracy, that economic model would spread organically. Yeah, I'm not asking anyone to force their workers or their companies to suddenly do that. I'm saying that once there are more of these companies appearing and popping up and everyone can understand how they are better for the conditions of the workers, you would start to see them grow more organically. In case you don't remember Lance, he's the guy who absolutely destroyed actual justice warrior in a debate. The two were discussing the Michael Brown incident and Sean was cleaning up. That is, until Lance decided to drop the hammer in his closing statement. Oh, and trans motherfucking rights. Absolutely devastating. Sean has not recovered since. Anyways, Lance is a socialist who apparently runs his little operation as a cooperative. On top of that, he plugs cooperatives for free whenever he can. So, let me say, without a hint of irony, good on him for walking the walk. I genuinely admire people who are willing to live their values, even if I don't personally agree with those values. And of course, I don't have any problem whatsoever with people voluntarily forming cooperatives. I think it's a terrible business strategy, but if that's how they want to do things, who am I to stop them? Of course, this is a one-way street. They insist that the traditional business model is exploitative, and they want to see the government intervene and eventually turn the entire economy into cooperatives. But people like Lance don't really know how to implement this model at scale. It's one thing to start your own cooperative, it's another to oversee an entire nation transforming itself along these lines. So, in the spirit of camaraderie, I think I'll help Lance out. Conveniently enough, there is a nation we can look to as a model. This nation really pushed worker-run cooperatives hard. This nation is Venezuela. Upon taking power, Hugo Chavez declared himself to be an advocate for socialism of the 21st century. This experiment in socialism would not be like the authoritarian dictatorships of the 20th century. This effort was going to give power to the people in a meaningful way, according to a study conducted by Camila Pinheiro Harkiner titled Workplace Democracy and Social Consciousness, a study of Venezuelan cooperatives published in Science and Society. While the exact numbers are hard to pin down, the estimated number of worker-owned cooperatives increased from 877 in 1998, when Chavez was first elected, to somewhere between 30,000 to 60,000 in less than 10 years. By the end of Chavez's second term, cooperatives accounted for about 8% of Venezuela's GDP and 14% of the workforce. How did they go about doing this? Well, in 2001, the Chavez regime passed a new cooperative law which relaxed regulations and put in a host of incentives to help start cooperatives. Cooperatives were granted preferential interest rates on government loans, 4% as opposed to 8%. They were also granted preferential treatment when it came to receiving government contracts. The Ministry of Popular Economy, now called the Ministry of Communal Economy, was created to oversee all of this as well as offer new cooperatives administrative and technical support. This was all constructed with the hope of having cooperatives catch on and implementing socialism nationwide. This was more of a pilot program than anything else. The hope was that these cooperatives would prove to be a training ground that would foster a better socialist mindset that would, in turn, foment more workplace democracy throughout the economy. Once workers realized the merits of cooperation over competition, they would soon break free of the false consciousness of capitalism and move on to the next step of economic progress. Just as Lance predicted will happen. As Harkiner writes, the promotion of cooperatives by the Chavez government is not merely a means to increase include the large number of unemployed or underemployed Venezuelans. Rather, policymakers see them as components of an economic model whose raison d'etre is collective well-being rather than capital accumulation. Cooperatives and other forms of self-management and co-management are being promoted also in reaction to their inability to win domestic and international capital over to the task of paying the social debt owed to the many marginalized Venezuelans. The hope was not only that government assistance in creating cooperatives would lead people to see the inherent superiority of that economic model, but that, rather than hoard profit the way a capitalist enterprise would, the cooperative workers would put money back into their communities through mutual aid and other charitable ventures. I've been told by people like Richard Wolff that worker-run cooperatives will be much more responsible and far more mindful of their communities than those callous capitalist enterprises. I understand the co-respectivity 
A worker co-op exists in the community. It has obligations to that community. The decisions a company, a, a, a worker co-op make that impact the community mean that the community has to have a democratic role and vice versa. They'll have to be very carefully worked out, shared, co-determined democracies between the residential location and the workplace location. And that's part of what a de democratization of the enterprise includes. There's none of this um, misquoting, if I may say so, of Adam Smith, that if we all pursue our self-interest by some magic, it'll work out to be the best for everybody. That's a rationalization for selfishness, which is not consistent with what I'm talking about. So it makes sense that this would be part of the goal. From a numbers standpoint, as I pointed out earlier, the program was a smashing success. These efforts did not go unnoticed at the time. In 2009, Noam Chomsky, the godfather of the online left, met with Chavez and said this. He said that I write about peace and criticize the barriers to peace. That's easy. Hablar de la paz y criticar aquellos que están en contra de la paz, de alguna manera es fácil. Uh, what's harder is to create create a better world, not to talk about it. Lo difícil es crear un nuevo mundo, un mundo diferente. Fácil es hablar de eso. And what's so exciting about uh, at last visiting Venezuela, I can see how a better world is being created and can speak to the person who's inspired it. He hoped that the Venezuelan model would have a global impact. Did the worker-run cooperatives achieve their broader goals? Did these enterprises serve the needs of the people and facilitate more socialist thought? Well, I'm not going to get into the economic angle at this point, as that is a larger discussion. Needless to say, I think they failed and Venezuelans' ongoing poverty attest to this fact. But surely we can't attribute that all to this, so again we'll leave that topic to be further explored later. What about building solidarity and socialist thought? Well, that didn't work out too well either. As Harkiner writes, It soon became clear to Venezuelan policymakers that many cooperatives were behaving like capitalist enterprises seeking to maximize their net revenue, i.e. their narrow and individual collective benefits, I think we call that profits, without consideration of the ways they could help alleviate the problems of their surrounding communities. For example, rather than supplying their products to local markets where there is need for them, as cooperatives have been called upon to do, some have chosen to export them to other countries where they can sell them at higher prices, or have preferred selling them to capitalist distributors and intermediaries rather than those most in need through Mersal. Mersal is a state-run food distribution network. Also, many cooperatives have refrained from accepting new members. Indeed, according to Carlos Molina, the former director of the state institution in charge of promoting and supervising cooperatives, the vast majority of them have decreased rather than increased operative workers I interviewed. In many cases, this is due to their difficult economic situation, but in some cases, it is because they fear that including new members is going to affect their income. It's almost as if human nature didn't fundamentally change when they started working in cooperatives. It's almost as if people continued to be self interested despite government policies trying to incentivize solidarity. I wonder why that is. Harkiner continues, although most members seem to be more aware of what they perceive are problems of their neighboring communities, their disposition to contribute towards solutions, the second component of local social consciousness, varies considerably and it seems to be influenced by several factors beyond the internal dynamics of the cooperatives. The most common argument used to oppose contributing to neighboring communities was the claim that their cooperatives' economic success was the result of their efforts alone. In other words, the Venezuelan government put all sorts of incentives in place, and yet people didn't behave in the way they wanted them to. Who could have possibly seen that coming? After they tried the peaceful method and it didn't work out, the rhetoric from Chavez himself started to change. In a 2007 interview, Chavez said, The model of cooperatives does not guarantee socialism because a cooperative is a collective private property. That is, if we are 20 in a cooperative, we are going to work for the benefit of us 20. And that is merely capitalism. Cooperatives would need to be impelled towards socialism. An enterprise is only truly socialist when society controls the means of production, and when these means are used towards societal ends. Chavez continues, An enterprise is socialist when it belongs to the entire community and, through communal councils, workers' councils, etc., operates under a direction, a plan, 
It produces in accordance with the interests not only of the cooperative members, but of an entire community. So Venezuela got its cooperatives, but it wasn't socialist enough for them. It's not a coincidence that the majority of property seizures and human rights abuses by the Chavez regime happened after this program was proven to be an abject failure. If you can't incentivize people to act the way you want them to, you have to force them. So, Lance, if you're listening, if you want to get this whole socialism thing off the ground, may I suggest that you skip the the whole worker-run cooperative thing and go straight to the part where dudes with guns start seizing private property. We'll get those Venezuelan results in no time. Mm.